you can't do with the, the app that they're actually at is you can't put them in the Android marketplace because it's intended to be a tool that can be used even by grade school students so they don't want a flood of you know, ABC apps and stuff like that. So, so uh, you can't do that for now. Although, I'm thinking with this new bridge, I haven't said yet, but I think you can begin to put those in the, in the, uh, in the store. Um, so that's kind of new. There's three parts to it. Um, there's an app engineer designer, which lets you build the GUI. It's almost like using an HTML5 editor and dragging over buttons and all the different tools. We'll see how that works in a minute. Then there's something called the blocks editor. That's the programming part, which is the jigsaw puzzle pieces where you kind of build your code, if you will. And then um, you can have a simulator or a device. So there's an emulator. That's the piece you have to download on your machine. Um, or you can actually, if you have your, your actual, if you have an Android device, a tablet or a phone, you can actually plug it in and download it directly to your device. We had a bunch of students do that in our, in our working connection session. So they can actually use everything, because the emulator obviously doesn't have accelerometers and GPS and, and all that. So you can try those kinds of things on an actual device. So this is a picture of kind of what the blocks editor looks like. The colors are better here than they are on the real thing. Anyway, um, so you get kind of an idea. So you build these little modules, little procedures and stuff to do various things, all in this blocks editor. So you just drag about pieces. And then let us have little different kinds of connectors, so you can't plug the wrong kind of puzzle piece in Of course, there I guess you could cheat. Um, to set up, to get set up, all you need is a Gmail account. So Google wants you to be a Google aficionado and use it. If you have a Gmail account, then you can go to appinventor.googleapps.com and download the, the installer piece and then set up an account. And I'll show you what that looks like here in just a minute. Um, everything's web-based after that, so you don't have to reinstall one. So I would say let's all do the install like it says up here, but we tried it and it sucks about as much bandwidth as what you know, we're trying to do. So probably won't get it by the time I'm done talking. Um, so you may want to try it on your own machine later or something like that. It only takes normally about a minute and a half to download it, but we take about 15 minutes to work that later. So uh, it's pretty quick usually. And then we're gonna, I'm going to build a couple little apps just to show you. So let me flip over to there. By the way, before I forget, I think I'm the only one that used it, but uh, um, we have a new wiki that the CTC set up called Mobile TCC. It's a mobile TCC um, I actually put my material up there. So if you want the PowerPoint and also the the, uh, the Scribbler app is a is a tutorial to guide you through building one of the things that I'm going to do. And also some pictures of me each one, and those are out there. And Ann tells me we're going to be adding everybody else's material out there soon, somewhere else here. Or here. So that will be right here for, uh, for your later use. So I wanted to mention that. Okay, I've already opened mine up, and I already have a project opened up. Let me go back to uh, do what it looks like normally. Let me open another. So, App Inventor. So, normally it comes up like this. They have a lot of tutorials and that kind of stuff. And there's a. You can learn and everything here. And then there's a My Projects thing, and this is the part that stays online. So, all your projects are online. So, here's a list of some of my projects. And then this is the one we're going to play with now. So, you have all these projects online. Um, we go into the designer. This is the design editor. So I've already laid out a couple things here, but I'm going to go through and do a new one and uh, kind of show you how to do this real quick. So let me create a new one. We'll call it Kitty2. No, that's close enough. Okay, so this is basically just like an HTML editor that you'd be used to, except there's some other tools over here. So I need a button. So I'm going to drag a button over here. And I need a label. And then we're going to have some sound. So I need to go down here to media. And I'm going to add a sound, which goes down. I, put, I drop it there, but it appears down here in the non-visible components. And then I'm going to change some properties. So this is just to show you how easy it is. So this is a button. I'm going to make this button um, have an image on it. 
So I have to add the image from my downloads. So kitty.png. There's my kitty. And then for this, I want to say, I can change all kinds of properties, but all I'm going to do is change the text. And it's going to say, pet the kitty. And then for the sound, I need a sound file, which I already had one which again is out there on the wiki if you want it later. So I have a meow. <coughs> Turn up my sound here. So we'll be able to hear it in a minute. So that's, that's my layout. This is a real simple <coughs> one. So I've got a button, a label, and a sound file. So almost like you're building a web page. Then to do the coding part, I'm going to open up the blocks editor. I'm just going to do a little quick download thing. Hopefully, it will be fairly fast. Yay. So, well, that's downloading. So, if you'll notice over here on the side, um, there's all kinds of groups. And there's that Lego Mindstorm group that I mentioned earlier. Oh, there's my block editor. Um, so this is then where I'm going to set up some code. And there's some built-in blocks, and then the my blocks is where all the pieces that I had uh, were part of that. So I'm going to use the button, and here's the kind of things that I can do. So there's actions. This is all event-driven. So everything's based on events. So the green ones here, kind of limey green, are events. So I can do things like when a button's clicked, when it gets focused, and all that. And then there's ones that are properties and set methods. So I'm going to say when the button's clicked, I need to do something. In this case, what I want to do is play a sound. So I'll go here to my sounds, and I'll do sound1.play. Drop that in there. Okay? And that's really all this one needs to do. But I need to create an emulator so we can see it work, since I don't have an Android phone with me. And this will take just a second. So while that's initializing, I was going to show you over here. There's um, obviously all the kinds of things you'd expect in like an HTML type editor, but there's also things like animations for games. In the Working Connections uh, session, we built an Angry Penguins game. So not exactly like Angry Birds. So um, There's access to social networking things like Twitter and texting, contact picker, which lets you pick things from your contact list on your phone. Um, you can access the various sensors, um, and they have just other stuff. There's things like barcodes, the barcode scanner stuff, Bluetooth. Um, they've got a text-to-speech and, and speech-to-text type thing. That one requires an app to be downloaded to the phone, but it's a free app. So there's quite a bit you can do, as well as some database kinds of tools. You can also open up web browsers and Google Maps and all that. Then they have some not ready for prime time stuff. That's that's their nice way of saying, hey, use this at your own risk, because we'll probably change it tomorrow. Um, but you can use it. OK, let's see if my emulator's ready yet. Usually the first time it takes the emulator a little bit to get ready. It's getting close. So it looks pretty much like a phone. I need to connect to it, which will download my app. This one you can't control much. If you're doing Java-based development for Android and using Eclipse, you can configure the emulator with different tools. And you can configure it for different versions of Android. And so you can do a lot more testing and stuff. This one's kind of locked into one particular configuration. But uh, um, you can make it look like more like a tablet, or you can make it look more like a phone. You can control what buttons there are, et cetera. So it's almost done. And there it is. And so now if I click on the kitty. I get a meow. Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> so, very simple app, but it gives you a, a basic idea of, of how the interface works. 
Another one which I have, which I'm going to show you for just a minute, um, and some of these are kind of like some of the tutorials, but I've done things a little bit differently. Um, and there's all kinds of interesting ones. This one, there's a, a uh, uh, out on the wiki, there's a, an exam, step-by-step uh, -step of how to do it. And I can show you some of the ones from Working Connections, too. Um, this is a Scribble app. So it lets you build a canvas, which this is part two, so it's got a picture there. Um, and I can do drawing types of things. So and that's a little more involved from the block editor's perspective. So I should have my block editor here. So there's a little more code to this one. Um, several button click ones, one for each of the colors, as well as some things that have to do with when you work with the canvas. The canvas is my drawing area. So when I touch the canvas, if I just touch it, it's just going to draw little circles, so little dots just like a paintbrush type program. And if I drag on it, then I can draw random shapes and stuff. So there's a little more code to it, but still, this will probably take you about five to seven minutes to, uh, to put together. Most of it having to do with all these values of, like for the dragging, that's the most complicated one. I'm just going to find my emulator again. Oops. there. Nope. Grab a new one real quick. And we see how this one works. Then I'll show you the Angry Penguins one. So this gives you an idea of, of how these different, different things work. So what we use it for, Ryan's using it in uh, not only our upper division class where we talk about mobile app development as kind of an entry part for the first couple of weeks, um, but we've also started using it in some of our introductory programming classes where we're just teaching basic C++ or Java, because it, it very quickly teaches the concepts of objects, because you've got all these objects, methods, and then event handling, because so many things we do, today, almost everything we do today, if it's in a graphical environment, is all event driven. So you can introduce those concepts, as well as things like loops and conditionals, all with just like the same concepts as Alice and the other ones, with no worry about syntax, typographical errors, all that kind of stuff. So they can learn how they work and what they do and get very quick visual feedback. And then like with this, they can even download it to their phone and take it home and show their little brother or whoever, um, hey, look what I built as this phone app. So they get some instant gratification, so to speak, um, rather than doing the you know, time-honored Fahrenheit to Celsius text-based conversion program immediately followed by following Hello World in whatever language you're teaching. So um, gives them something a little more interesting to uh, to show for uh, what they've done. And then now with this bridge to Java, you can move them into the Java environment and do these kinds of things um, using these same widgets. So the methods and everything are the same, but they have to write the code around it, the Java code around it, to build a, a complete application. Should download in a second. Does anybody have any questions while this is downloading to the emulator? This is the only slow part. It takes sometimes a minute to get the emulator initialized. Is that your cat? No, it's not my cat. It's just a general cat. Looks kind of like my cat, though. He's got more white, though. OK, so now I can go up here and I can pick a color. And then I can draw dots. So I could give him red eyes, for example. Or I can give him green whiskers. Okay. So just a scribble application. But again, another, huh? There you go. So uh, again, the intent is not to build a, a sophisticated app for this purpose, but just get used to the concepts of, you know, doing something like this. I know back in the day when I taught, you know, Windows SDK programming, that was like the first six weeks of class to do something like that, you know. So <laughs> it's a little easier today, but uh, not that much. So some fairly simple things that we can do, and then it's got a white button down here to clean everything and start over again. Um, so you do those kind of things. Let me show you one that's a little, even a little more complicated. This is one of the ones we did at Working Connections. So I find it. There we go. So this one involves timers. This is the, the angry penguin one. And it also uses the concept of sprites, so things that move around on the screen. So it doesn't look like much. It's got a canvas with a sprite and a couple of 
labels that we redraw on a reset button, but it also has a jump timer. So this uses a event-driven handler that goes off every five seconds or whatever and causes the penguin to jump around. Of course, you're trying to hit it, so that's the idea. So it's kind of a whack-em whack type game. So let me get the blocks editor up. So again, this one actually also allowed us to introduce the concept of variables because we need to keep track of things. How many times you hit, how many times you missed. So there's some variables defined, so those definition lines like the second one down there. And then when the jump timer goes off, what do I do? It also let us introduce for the first time when we were doing the class the concept of writing your own procedures. So rather than just using the ones that come with the different objects like when the button's clicked and all that, we also had to write some of our own procedures. So there's like move P and there's another one farther down that were procedures that we wrote so we could call them inside things like the jump timer. So you can introduce the concept of modular programming um, very easily with this. So, and then what to do when the various buttons are clicked. Um, another interesting one on this one was that uh, the students had to work on is uh, there was a method for when the penguin got touched or the sprite and then one for when the canvas was touched which would normally be a miss. One of the interesting things is whenever you hit the sprite, it also causes, it also counts as a canvas hit. So we would get, you know, when you first wrote it, every time you hit the penguin, you'd get a hit, but you'd also get a miss because it would count as a canvas. So you had to figure out how to, how to do that. And there was the, the, the cheap and dirty way, which was, well, if you hit it, then just decrement the miss counter and knowing that it was going to get incremented. But then we discovered that there's some information that was passed to us on the, the canvas touch one. Let's see if I can... So right here, there was a Boolean that was passed to us that told us if the sprite had been touched as well. So we could use that to do it instead. So students got to learn a little bit about uh, procedures that receive arguments, because that's what those are, are, incoming arguments. So all the kinds of programming concepts we teach in the first six weeks in an introductory programming course, we have illustrated here. Now, I think it's already loaded to my emulator. So there it is. And he's moving pretty fast. I don't know if I'll be able to hit him or not, especially using the trackpad. But so he moves it around. Now some of my students went beyond because they got pretty frustrated with this too. And they decided to add a, another thing down here with a slider so you could change the, how fast he moved. So, uh, so you could, if you got really frustrated, you could sl slow it down. So it was the frustration slider. Um, but a simple game like that. But it illustrates, all, again, a whole lot of the points that we try to teach in programming. And we did all these. Of course, this was a group of adults, but I think Students would do, traditional students would probably do it faster. We did this and a couple more labs in one day. So I've taught basically the entire first six to eight weeks of an introductory programming class, all the concepts in about a day. So you can get a lot of those kinds of things uh, using this kind of tool. What, again, whether you're teaching pro basic programming or whether you're moving into mobile app development. So you get kind of the best of both worlds with this kind of tool. It's a good segue then into moving into Java or whatever else you're going to do. Do you want okay. to take a little bit of a break and have everybody go get snacks and bring them back? Sure. Okay, I would hate for you to miss out on snacks. <laughs> 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 I mean, people... and, and the coffee. And the coffee, yeah. 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 Get them while the getting good. Yeah. I thought that might be a good break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right.
how we tell you. Are you done with yours, or are you going to be? I think, I think so. I'm just going to ask you guys if you guys have questions. Oh, okay, because I just want to set my laptop up. Yeah, me too. It's a little hard thing on what they can play with. Yeah, I'll Am I going to go first or you can go first? I want to go first. Yeah, we'll do. Okay. I'm just going to do mine real fast. I'm going to go through my slot. In fact, I'm going to barely go through my slot. Well, I thought we had a lot more time now. That one was real short. Two. And then uh, I'm going to probably just hang the laptops up, show them real quick how Because all I'm going to have to do is set up some stages. Real fast. We've got plenty of time now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Well, I'm sure that um, they're going to want to do a. Yeah, we're in the third week of the class, they can be Hello World, and we don't care. 
just, you know, just, just to get it. Seven trees in two years. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. said that he really made that his career. He really just couldn't sell on the trees. He couldn't sell on the trees. He couldn't sell on the trees. He couldn't sell on the We've discussed starting a, a track on the mobile app development. Yeah. And so what you're saying, it may not matter. You know, it's more so than just local, it's regional or national. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think just because it's new, yeah, I'm sure, the next level, um, he finally was like, you know, some of it, I, I get contacted by people who say, I need an app for iPhone, and um, you know, I've already got the icon made and the title, and so now all I need is the program. Yeah, so like, no, well, sure, yeah, that have done most of the work. Um, you know, so, yeah. Oh, they want they want your class to do it as a project. Right? Yeah, yeah. I got lots of opportunities. They want to go like so for nine hours. Yeah. 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 So, um, so there's a lot of that. A lot of people who think it's. Uh,
Still be on. It's still on. Still hear me? Okay. Just a couple of quick wrap-up things. Um, one thing I wanted to mention: if you decide to use this App Inventor environment, um, even though you can't put the apps into the uh, marketplace, what you can do is there's a package for device, so you can create a file. It's an APK file. I'm not like you download it to like your device when you're hooked up to the. Uh, to the blocks editor, but you can take that and email it to people or post it on a website. So you can distribute the app for local use. So for example, uh, if you wanted to build an app to use in your classroom to do like some kind of custom flashcards for quizzing students to prepare for an exam or something like that, you can distribute it to all the students and they can download it to their phone. You just can't put it out in the marketplace where you can distribute it to everybody in the world or whatever. So unlike Apple where you have to go through some, you either have to buy the enterprise license or get it approved for their store to be able to distribute it to other devices. So, so you can do some limited dis distribution like within your campus or something like that. You just can't put it in the worldwide marketplace. Um, so you can do some interesting things with it. Um, and then you can migrate into the Java world and Eclipse and all that kind of stuff where you can develop full-blown apps. And then I just want to see if there was any questions that anybody had before we keep us on track by letting Bill do his stuff. Yes, ma'am. Well, we're, we're currently doing it two places. I know Ryan last semester used it in one of our 1030 classes, which is like the very first computer science class that majors take. Um, as just for, what did you like, two weeks or something like that? Yeah. Just but a, just as a, a chance to get them introduced to uh, <clears throat> loops and conditionals and, and that kind of stuff. And it's kind of a fun way to get them interested in the class before they go start doing all the boring kinds of things you <laughs> typically do in a first, first computer science class. So that's right. We keep them until the twelfth class day, and then they can't leave, right? So, <clears throat> no, just kidding. <laughs> I can say that here. There's no students. So, um, and then we also do a mobile apps class that we teach as a three thousand level course, um, and we alternate. I guess the last two semesters we've done it Android, but we've also done it in the iPhone side. So we kind of switch back and forth. And then, I guess this last semester you did it as a they could choose whatever, pretty much whatever platform they wanted to do. So it was almost more like a topics class. So we talked about mobile devices, but then they could do their projects in whichever platform they wanted to. So, um, okay, yeah. I was going to say, I, I spoke to Ryan uh, at the break, and uh, it was interesting. Uh, he commented that how many companies were sort of uh, 
trying to grab the students even before they were done. Absolutely. So it sort of shows, I guess, the need out there for mobile app development. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say every semester I get about five to seven emails from companies saying, hey, have you got some students that can work on an app? You know, just as interns or whatever, or for free, but we'll give them a piece of the action or, you know, whatever. So, so well, it, is, it is pretty hot. We want to have an app that <laughs> okay. And cool. The sessions and all that stuff. We need to talk to you about that because maybe we, we're thinking we could have some of your students work on Yeah. That. Well, actually, I have a student because we do some capstone courses in our IT program, and I have a student this coming year in, that's coming into capstone. He's already negotiated this. We, we have in Denton and Denton County, we have a new train system. They just started in June. Um, it's part of the Dallas area rapid transit. It used to have buses, but now they've added a train system that connects to the Dallas rapid transit. He's already talked to the people at, at uh, DCTA and has already gotten approval for them to build an app that will track the trains and tell you when they're going to be at the stations, if they're on time or not. And they're using the GPS locators on the phones that the train drivers carry to tell them where the trains are at. And then your app will be a client. You could be staying at the station, and it'll tell you the train's two minutes late or a minute early, or as well as having the schedules and all that kind of stuff. So he's already cleared it all, and, and he's already set up to do that as an app for, for next semester. So, so we have students using that as their, as their capstone stuff, too. They're getting really interested in the apps and, and working with local industry and stuff to, to do interesting, interesting things with them. So it gives opportunities for those kinds of you know, case studies and capstones and project-type classes, too. Any other questions or comments? We're, we're actually slowly, uh, only slowly because it changes every two weeks, we're slowly packaging a bunch of this material to put out on the CTC curriculum website. So there'll be some material out there too. I will tell you that a lot of it will be link-based because the, I know like the App Inventor manual changes about every two weeks. So if we gave you a copy of it, by the time you used it in a class, it would be like five revisions old. <laughs> so we'd rather give you a link to where it's at than, than actually copy the manual, but we are putting some things together to use. And I think in the, in the next grant we're talking about also looking at some of these third-party integration tools where you can build an app one time and, and then uh, package it for Android or, or iPhone or Blackberry or you know, all the major platforms. So it's just that there's not any free ones out there, at least not any that work well. So it requires a little bit of an investment, but we're looking into what are the best ones that are hopefully going to stay around so we can do that too. Okay, Bill, all yours. Actually, or, let's <laughs> do, we have, do we have color commentary? Do we need to have like the, do we need to have the little coaches, do we have the little coaches thing where you can draw pictures and stuff? <laughs> Hello again. Uh, you're going to uh, give us a definition of it. Actually, I before, before Clinton is going to make a comment, um, I can, I'm going to share with you a story now, Craig, because I was sitting there and thinking, where have I met him? In fact, uh, I was one of his students uh, in, in 1994 or 95. Uh, that was my first networking course, which is uh, Novell. So I'm very pleased to, to finally meet my old professor <laughs> for a very long time. It must have been 18 or 19 years. So. <laughs> I think uh, he, he deserves applause. <laughs> I, I was thinking. <laughs> so uh, I'm handing this over to you. Well, when, we got together on, when we got together on Sunday, one of the things we realized was definition of voice over IP versus IP telephony versus unified communications. You'll see them all in the airplane magazines, and they hardly ever define them very specifically. So two wanted to give a little definition of the difference between what voice over IP is and what IP telephony is, and then we'll take it and go from IP telephony to unified communications. Okay, I guess it's a, it's a fair question, and that question has been, been raised uh, all the time. Uh, first of all, it's uh, terminology is confused people. What is voice over IP and what is IP telephony? So how many of you know what the term voice over IP means? Okay. <laughs> Hey, go ahead. Oh, yeah, uh, can you give us a definition? Well, it's, yes, using it's putting telecommunications over a data network using the IP protocol. Okay. Exactly. So let's say that you have an enterprise solution and you have uh, deployed voice IP per se. 
when you make a call internal within your net own network, that's for IP, truly IP protocol. But when you make an outbound call, basically it's go through the voice gateway and basically it's go to the uh, public switch, uh, switch telephone network and there's no longer, no, no longer be called as a voice or IP, but instead it should be called as IP telephony. So that's the definition between the two. And then when we go from IP telephony to unified communications or unified communications and collaboration, we actually take it to the next level. And this is really an important one because, again, bringing back the students to the business side that they have to talk to those crazy business people out there that don't want to hear about the bits and bytes and that you're riding an IP network with a voice signal or any of that kind of stuff. What they want to really hear about is how does it affect the business. We call it the trifecta. Nowadays we have the SIP trunking, we have presence, and we have the IP telephony and collaboration tools. When you bring the three of those together, what you enable to do is you can re-engineer the business process with what's called communications-enabled business processing applications. Now these applications come with the S SDK, the toolkits, and you build them and it allows you to go in like in a hospital where when someone wants to check out of a hospital, how, anybody here been in a hospital and a doctor goes at 9 in the morning, you can go home today, and at 2.30 in the afternoon you're still sitting on the end of the bed? <laughs> It's because of all the human breakdowns in the process, the paperwork that needs seven different signatures and the pharmacy and the physical therapist and all those things is if you can take and use your collaboration tools in, in unified communications and communicate and find a, a person's available on their cell phone but not their desk phone, communicate it that way and give them the ability to reply back and even automate things that don't need a human in the middle, then you get that collaborative effect coming in and changing the business process. So if a technician graduates from our schools and they go tell somebody, we really need to put in a really cool dial tone, they're going to go, no, I don't think so. I think the dial tone's working really good on my 20-year-old Nortel system I have on the desk. <laughs> it's not the dial tone. It's that trifecta of what you can do with SIP trunking with cost savings, the audio and video conferencing, the, uh, the collaboration tools, and most importantly, changing the way you do your business. If you put in an expensive phone system and treat it the same way you do your 20-year-old Nortel phone, it's worth the same amount of the 20-year-old Nortel phone. So having the students really understand, they got to look at it from how does this impact the business? It's critical going forward. Can I add something on that? Actually, you've done a pretty good job. I'm going to take Tuan's question one step earlier. So how many, how many of you in this room know why we had, we had to go to voice over IP for telephony? I, I work in the in the in the tel in in telecom, so I, you know I would know that. So any any idea? So the question is why we had to, or why we why why, were we, why was the industry forced to to go from circuit switch network to voice over IP, basically? Cost. Yeah, but why though? It is cost. You're right. But what what was the trigger point of the cost? All right. So in the old days, we had the old good old dial-up, right? Everybody had the dial-up for data. And when the internet came about, what we would do at home, uh, we would dial up and we would <coughs> tie up that whole circuit for eight hours a day or even more. And everybody started doing that. The whole neighborhood started doing that. And Southwestern Bell just couldn't handle it. And AT&T in those days were the long distance guys. So all the local R, local R box just could not handle it. So they came to us and then of course Cisco figured out they had, they could take over the world. So <laughs> <laughs> because, did. and they did because they had the data protocol and you know, voice over IP, some will say it, you know, uh, is there. So that was the reason to, to basically, to, to, to use the telephony to, to to create the same environment in the telephone world as the data world. Glenn, do you remember when we first started doing the Convergence Technology Business Council? There were Cisco reps that then said there was no need to teach anything about legacy telephony. Mm -hmm. And this was 2003 time frame, that within two years everything was going to be voice over IP. Well, it is, kind of. But it wasn't two years, it took longer. Oh yeah, we're about halfway there. Yeah. Yeah, we still, in the infrastructure side, we, we still have a lot of challenges right. in terms of uh, latency and, and degradation and back to loss. There's, there's still a lot of challenge, but yeah. So, 
in, in closing, you know, we talked about the current and the business, but really talking about the future is important. Because we're going to reach a tipping point in 2015, which sounds a long ways off, but that's about the 51 percentile of SMBs in the world, which makes up the vast majority of the businesses we have, are going to go to a cloud-based telephony solution. Today, premise is the, is the 95, 98 percent range of where people are doing it. They're putting the box on the premise or they're putting it in a data center, but it's going to go to a cloud base and you're going to buy unified communications as a service. So as our students start coming up through the ranks over the next few years, part of our curriculum has to tie together the virtualization, the software as a service, the platform as a service, the infrastructure as a service, and the IP telephony. Because knowing telephony without understanding how it applies in the cloud and the new challenges you get in a cloud environment, and there are quite a few, I can tell you today, that we run, run into them every day, even at Dell in our labs and at Alcatel and places like that. So having the students really start paying attention to what happens when you move it from the premise to a hosted server to a cloud server. Uh, it changes the way you do your business. It changes your security. So really what I'm saying is our students are going to have to know security, they're going to have to know servers, they're going to have to know storage because of all the video storage and the multimedia, and they're going to have to know the telephony. So the people that graduate from these programs that can at least speak that language and have a good sound base foundation, they're going to be invaluable in the workforce. They'll never, go on, they'll never go without employment if they can do that, if they can look forward to where they need to be in 2014 or 15. And with that, thank you. Okay, we got a little tag team going up here in that um, Ernie and myself are going to do uh, voice over IP as can be done in your classroom and how it relates to a very, very high-end mobile environment, a lot of mobility, the ability to use your smartphones as a SIP device, again, the unified communications that was just talked about. And Ernie and I actually, when we were talking about this a couple of months ago, when we were trying to put this together, was trying to figure out how we can tie in both of what, how we both do this in our classroom. We both teach the same kind of material, but I do it from one side, he does it from the other. He said, wait a minute, got the same coin. Um, so I'm going to start by showing you what, uh, how you can do a voice over IP very, very inexpensively, very, very simply, very, very cheaply, but yet with a lot of very powerful features using the open source version of Asterisk uh, called Trix, Trixbox. And what's really cool is Ernie has a whole set of labs and a whole set of instructions using the Linksys slash Cisco hardware using the same software. It's an asterisk implementation on hardware. So it would be the next step up. In both of these cases, we're still talking about a very, very generic program that cuts a wide swath across the entire marketplace. Um, don't be, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on my presentation. In fact, so if I race through the slides, I'm going to make sure the slides are up on the wiki side so you can get them as you need to. I want to get you some hands on, I know Ernie wants to as well, um, setting up basically some extensions. It takes uh, quite a bit of time to simply install the software uh, on a server and you just don't want to sit there and watch this thing just spin around. So I've already pre-installed uh, a server and have the clients, but what I'd like you to do, we have some computers that already have a uh, soft phone. I have some hard phones in the back we can program. Set up some extensions, set up uh, a phone, try to make some phone calls to each other. So anyway, let me get started real quick so as not to take up a lot of our time. Oh, that's my favorite expression, yes. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm not going to get into a lot of the detail. Glenn already explained a lot of it of, on why voice over IP, so I'm going to skip ahead. <coughs> How many of you are familiar with the asterisk system of some form or another? It's an open source version. There are lots and lots of implementations of it. Uh, it is a very powerful system. It performs I would say 90% of what you would get on a high-end system like a Cisco, Cisco Call Manager, Nortel, Avaya, Toshiba, and so on. It does require a little more tweaking. You have to understand a little bit more how it goes on, like anything else that could be open source. Uh, Asterisk is a PBX. It can be an internet, uh, I'm sorry, voice over IP gateway. It supports all of the major protocols, SIP, H323 the major codec groups, et cetera, et cetera. So again, very highly standardized. So it's very easy. You don't have to teach specialized protocols. 
uh, where you're saying, well, this is what voice over IP, oh, and by the way, this is the way Cisco does it, or this is the way Nortel does it, which is different than the way that Toshiba does it. You can keep a very even uh, keel on that. That's kind of cool as well. The nice thing about the asterisk and the way you do it, the way that it's set up, like, for example, in here, hardware that's supported is probably just in your lab right now. The server we're using today is just an old Dell, it's the same older Dell laptops that we have. The soft clients can run on any Windows XP. There is Mac versions, there's Linux versions, and in fact, if my phone holds its charge, there's even a SIP, a free SIP phone. If you have an Android, that runs, and Gordon sent me a link for uh, a free SIP phone that you can get off the iPhone app store, which will connect to Asterisk. So very easy, there's your mobility. So we have at instant the ability to say, here are mobile apps. You can now make a phone call through your corporate office, your home office, whatever, without having to have any specialized communications hardware or software. Just some variations of it. Trix is probably one of the easiest implementations. It's very easy, you're gonna see it. I'm gonna demo it very quickly in just a second. Elastics uh, is not only asterisk on the voice over IP side, but it's also the full unified communication center, including combinations with email, contact management, and so on. And Zental is another interesting one that you can look at. All of these, again, open source and free. Here's what I like about it. That's what it costs to set up a lab using uh, an asterisk box. That's what it costs with Cisco Call Manager Express for one pod. That's kind of a difference. There are some additional hardware. You can buy hard phones if you need to. They're very, SIP phones can be very inexpensive. Uh, the ones I have here are my little Polycoms. Those were actually about $110. Those were, were a little bit cheaper. Uh, I do have some examples. Um, we didn't set them up in the interest of time, but if you guys want to hang out a little bit afterwards, we have uh, uh, basically cordless phones and uh, video phones that can be used as well. Uh, I've created some documentation. Uh, we'll show you. I do have some installation manuals that I'll pass out while we're setting them up to help you out with that as well. So that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about, <laughs> other than just to kind of show you how to get in and play with it for just a minute. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to actually go to the asterisk server, the Trixbox server, set up an extension. And then uh, what I'll do is I'll probably yank one of the uh, Dells over here and uh, show you how to do the, um, uh, set up the uh, uh, soft phone. And then I have full instructions on how to set up the hard phones if you're interested. Pretty much step-by-step -step instructions. Before I go on, any questions so far? Okay. And fortunately I've got to put my eyes on. The Astra server is all web-based configuration. The installation is about three things you have to type in. A, uh, a password, a language, and I think you just have to click OK. And all of the rest of it is just <laughs> self-installed. Then you go in and do all your configurations. And there we go. OK. <coughs> so if you, I mean, if you could put this into your DNS server, you could obviously go by name. So I've, I'm now sitting on the box. There are two modes. There's a user mode and there's a maintenance mode. I'm just going to switch into the maintenance mode very quickly. Uh, password is maint, and of course, username and passwords can be changed, but I'm going to leave it the default, which is maint for the username, password. <coughs> and again, you'll see how to do this in just a second when we get in. A lot of information out there. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the interesting things you can do about it. I'm just going to set up a real fast extension. 
So the way you do it is you click on the button or you look at the tab for PBX and we go to PBX settings. Now these are uh, all of the things you can do. Your navigation is all on the left side and then the content on the right. So I'm going to basically create a simple extension. It's a generic SIP device. Um, if any of you are familiar with some of the other protocols, Asterisk has their own internal protocol called IAX. Uh, very that's a very nice protocol to use if you wanted to have like say two Asterisk servers and you wanted to put a trunk between them, which is one of the things I do in my labs. I actually have the students, they create a full mesh network and they have to create point to point trunks with each other. It's always, it's always fascinating to say, what was your IP again? and try to figure that out. So we're just going to go with the generic SIP device. You click the submit button to say, okay, now create one. Now over here, these are the extensions we've already created, that I've already created. So we can create a new one right now. Um, you try to keep a call pattern number. Any numbers can work three digits or four digits. So I'm going to create a new one. And they don't have to be in sequence. I have 200, 201, 202. I could do, do 205. Uh, just remember there would therefore be no 203 and 204. I could try to dial them. So if I do a 205, the display name is when you make a phone call, uh, the person at the other end says, oh, I am getting called by Jim Kirk. So if we wanted to say here something really cool like Dr. You knew I was going to do this, right? Now, there is so much on this page uh, that you can go through, but it's really fast because all you have to do is put in the extension number, the user's display name. You have a password that you can get on. Now, the password is usually a number because, again, people are going to be doing this on phones. Um, just even though it's a horrible password, I would not recommend this in the real world, but I tell my students, put in the same password as you put in for your extension, in this case 205. I'm going to enable voicemail. And voicemail can have a separate, pa a different password or the same password. Again, always recommend that your students play with it a little bit. And click Submit. And I think I hit, oh, I can't put the period in there. Sorry about that. Okay, so the extension is now created. Now the one thing that, when I teach this in my class, students say, hey, I can't get to the extension, it doesn't ring, it doesn't work. I say, did you remember to click the apply button? <laughs> Oops. <clears throat> and by the way, that happened to me last night. I'm trying, I'm dying trying to figure out, this isn't working, oh, heck, I forgot to do this. <coughs> you click that, it will reload. Now in here, if we all set it up, now you can all access the server at the same time. But for those of you that are on the laptops, talk to each other, find out who's doing what, because if two people hit the apply at the same time, it's whoever got their, whoever got their last gets it, or first gets it. Whatever it is, you have to make sure you stage them out. So say, is anybody clicking on apply? Anyway, so now we have the extension all ready to go. At this point, all you need to do is program the phone. I'm actually gonna program one of the hard phones back there to show you how to do it really fast. So again, the phones as well have an IP address on them. Now they'll pick up, their, they'll pick up the address from the DHCP server or you could assign a manual address. And if I saw that correctly, let's see if I get the right one. Yes. Now these are Polycom phones. Uh, you, can use, you could use these same links as phones. In fact, I do in the class, so we repurpose them for both the Linksys projects as well as the uh, asterisk. They are SIP. Anything that's a standard SIP phone can work just fine. Username is Polycom. The password is 456. 
that's the default. Don't change it, please. Um, for time server, if you want the time to be correct, you can put any, if you have your own time server set up on a, on a Microsoft AD or Linux environment, you could do that. Or you could do, what is it, time.nist.gov. Assuming that you have a internet connection. One warning on a lot of these phones is because they are all web-based, is generally you have to click either a submit or apply button on every screen just to make it work. Because if you try to wait to the end, what happens is it, when it flips screens, it loses the values. So the phone should be, Julie, is that phone doing something? The one right in front of you? Yeah, reconfiguring. All right. No, I've only got that one. Is that one doing it too? That was me. Oh. <laughs> as soon as it restarts. Then what I'll do is I'll show you how to program the SIP tab, which is the, um, or the network, <coughs> no, the SIP tab and the lines tab, and that should pretty much do it, and you can actually see it work. Okay. Not quite. Okay, now it's up. Sorry. Okay. Hopefully it comes back. Oh, there we go. Okay. So on the SIP tab, that was weird. Okay. Wonder where we got that number from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, on this on this tab, all you have to do on any SIP phone is tell it the IP address of where to find the server. Think of SIP as a protocol very much like email. So if you're configuring a POP, SMTP, or IMAP type server, all you have to do is say, where will I find my services? So in this case. It's 192, same address, 168, 100.1. And there's a lot more you can program on it if you want to. You click the Submit button. Again. Apologize for the short delay while the phone reboots. Yes. Uh, you'll get, you just have to make sure that, well, the station number will come up. If you use static IP addresses, in other words, you manually program it, you've got to be real careful. DHCP, no, because it'll grab an IP address. But you cannot program the same extension on two phones, uh, the same extension on two or more phones. But I mean, in this room, is there an issue? No. Okay. No. Bill, what is the real benefit? The rates are much less? For you're talking about in you're talking about a generic vo in voice over IP why you would be good in the class oh oh exactly the re I mean um, uh, the business team spoke about that earlier number one it is a somewhat less expensive way of bringing dial tone into a company but the more important reason is the unify the ability to unify communications um, Glenn do you want to speak to that more yeah, specifically just, just briefly is. I mentioned uh, the trifecta, including SIP trunking. But one of the values of SIP trunking is that you share the trunking. When you traditionally think of voice and trunking, you get like 24 channels. And if you only use 12 of them or five of them, you pay for 24 of them. With SIP trunking, they're allocated across your network. So that if you only need 22, you have one SIP trunk, and it can be used across five facilities. So you can imagine the kind of cost savings you're going to have. It could range anywhere I've seen in companies of 20% up to as high as 65% on trunking costs, which is a significant cost of your network. <coughs> then when you start tying in your email into your voicemail, 
and having the ability to uh, automate things that you're doing, like bringing up a video conference with one click and dragging people into it, <coughs> it becomes more more uh, collaborative in nature. But on the cost saving side, bringing audio conferencing in house, where you're doing it on your own servers, video conferencing in house, SIP trunking, those alone usually bring enough savings to pay for the whole new system over about two years. So they're pretty significant. Audio conferencing will save you about eighty percent <coughs> over what you pay a carrier to do that. Now, if you're using free, it doesn't beat free. So <laughs> there are some free systems, but they don't scale for enterprise. Yeah, this is not. I don't know if this system would scale up to an enterprise, but for a small business, but it's an excellent way to teach concepts. The, the voice over IP protocols, all the technology that we're using here is the same conceptually that you would use, whether it would be everything from this, like I said, Toshiba, Cisco, uh, Avaya, the old Nortel, I mean, voice over IP concepts, codecs, things like that, and it's a very easy to get into entree for students to play with the, the environment and see how it's like. Does that phone ever come yes. back again? Oh, it did, okay. <coughs> okay, I'm gonna now come over to lines. Now the lines is where we actually program the extension. Remember the extension we created in the asterisk? In that case, it was 205 for Dr. McCoy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the address in here right now, 205. Now, the user authentication and the password, remember, we used all the same, just to keep it simple. So I'm just going to put 205 and 205 there. Label's kind of interesting. If you put a label there, that's the name that'll appear on the phone. If you don't put a label, it's just the extension. This just happens to be Polycom's way of doing it. Linksys will do it one way. Uh, Grandstream will do it a second way, and so on and so on. So that's pretty much all you have to do. And if you'll pardon, we have to do this one more time. These phones happen to have, these particular phones have two separate lines, so I could program two separate extensions on them. So I could have 205 and 206. And if it was a second extension, you saw there was a line two, so you could program that second extension if you wanted to on the phone. Some phones have as many as four, some of the, some of the real inexpensive SIP phones. And again, if you're using a soft phone, which we are using. I've got X Lite installed on the Dell laptops. Uh, it's already installed, so you'll just be able to configure it with the instructions. Again, all you're going to do is you're going to put in the server address, you're going to put in the user identification, the extension number, if you will, and then you can start making calls. There are headsets uh, that are usable, and the X Lite I'm using also has a video capability if you happen to have a, um, a webcam. So you could have uh, video as well, although that does take quite a bit more bandwidth if you're running it over the internet. Are we up yet? Or is it not, not still configuring? Okay. Not yet. Yes. Okay. Yes. So pick up the phone and dial, even though there is nobody up there with 200, dial 200. And press the button that says dial. And you should all of a sudden say, this. you'll hear the phone ringing. I don't know where the dial button is. It's oh, there. It says dial. The one that says dial on it. <laughs> Tell me what you're right yeah. next to the end. The person is unavailable. Do I have to join your number first somehow? Hmm? Do I have to join your number before I do that? Yes. It says I'm 201, but I guess not. Uh, um, <clears throat> it's yeah, you could join as 201. Except that. <laughs> Oh, there is no 200 set up yet. Oh, okay. So you could dial 205. You set yours up on the phone? You could dial 205 because 205 is configured on that phone, and if you've already configured. Hello. Oh, it Did it work? <laughs> All right, it worked. Watson, I... come here. I need you. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to now. Did you want to do your presentation? Okay. Uh, I'm going to let Ernie do his presentation, and then we'll uh, sit down and do combinations of both oh, no, keep going here. the lab on the uh, Dell equipment on the asterisk, and we can do uh, the lab on the links. <laughs> okay, hello everybody. Uh, Ernie Friend again. How many of you all uh, have included or teach voice classes at your schools? A few of you, good. 
What uh, what what tools do you use? What uh, do you use? Uh, Cisco's product mostly. Yeah. So, what's one? Digimasters, okay. And, and, and Cisco uh, call manager. Okay, great. Is that a whole course or is it just a uh, part of what? It's a whole course until it got cut this past year. Oh, did it? Yeah, because we, we, we have a, a, voice, uh, a voice track and it's pretty popular. I think the reality today for uh, most techs, you know, uh, originally when you had uh, the, the PBXs, that was a lot of times that was outsourced. You had a person come in, charge you 90 bucks an hour. Every time they changed a, um, you wanted to move a phone, it's called Max, move ads and changes. Um, so it was sort of a, lot of, a lot of it was sort of outsourced to whoever installed your system. But today, uh, the, 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 the general networking person handles a voice as well. So, you know, I, you guys may remember when wireless first came out. It, was, it, it seemed like that was going to be a separate sort of thing where you could have wireless text. Well, that just went to the network folks. And eventually so did the phones if you're using voice over IP. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a, a, a Linksys has a product um, that um, that uh, was bought. You know, when, they, when Cisco bought them out, they they got this product as well. But it's basically what Bill's talking about, except it's in a nice, neat box. Um, um, you know, asterisk. You know, at one point it was all uh, it, it wasn't menu driven. It was sort of um, command line. Um, and one of the advantages at the time with with the uh, Linksys product is it um, it was menu driven. And real quick, let me show you. Have you all ever seen a, a, a traditional PBX? They're you know, about the size of a refrigerator. Now, obviously, they've got you know some bigger features, but this this replaces a lot of what was going on inside that PBX. So you know, it weighs a few ounces, and you see how small it is. So this is um, Linksys Linksys's version of a PBX. Now, obviously, you can't have several T1s coming into this, and and you know, and whatnot. There are obviously some features that a bigger PBX has provided. But uh, in most cases, this will do a lot of what a uh, SOHO, a, a small office, home office needs. Uh, I've had some students who um, you know, have gone through these labs go out and they set up an entire um, voice network for a, a church, you know, a company maybe with four or five people. Uh, because the, some of the other solutions um, for, say, a small company might be um, renting a service from the uh, local phone company and might cost them you know, per phone, maybe 100, 150 bucks a month, uh, depending on what kind of features they have. Well, you know, once this is installed, you have an internet connection. I mean, you're you're done. You know, paying the phone company. Obviously, they don't like that, um, but uh, you know, it's a good solution for a lot of small companies. So let me. Um, uh, Ann asked uh, myself and um, a colleague of mine, Shell Schmidt, um, a couple years ago to write some labs. Uh, very detailed labs that uh, sort of accompany um, the uh, Linksys products. So I'm going to go through and, and talk about those now. Uh, we we'll probably skip this. I think we've probably hit this enough. Uh, but, but real quick, I think one of the things that uh, one of the big distinctions I think we have to make is what Bill and I are talking about are not enterprise level solutions, right? These are solutions for, uh, in, the, in the case of the Linksys, probably easily less than 50 people. I don't know about asterisk. Probably around that. Uh, obviously, an enterprise system you need a lot, you know, a lot more features um, that these may not offer. And certainly, you know, a large company isn't going to consider something like this. But it works very, very well for a company five, ten, fifteen, twenty-five people. Um, these, the, the the labs that we wrote, <coughs> excuse me, the labs that we wrote. Basically, this is when you get done, you can build something like this. Um, so you have a couple analog phones. That's the SPA 9000, which I just showed you. This is uh, SPA 400, which is a little bit bigger. It's that one on the right there, Bill. It's a little, a little bit larger. The only reason it's larger is because it has more interfaces. Um, you know, one of the things you're still going to want to do with uh, any phone system, at least in the, in the near term, is you still need to connect to some analog lines. Um, you can, uh, in, a, in one of the labs that I wrote, the last lab that I wrote, um, that probably took the longest to figure out, was how to connect all this to Skype. So you can make a call through the internet, you know, to a cell phone in class, um, and there is a lab included on that. But let's say you're you're a, um, you know, a church or a small company, and you've got you know a couple of analog lines. You still you may want to keep the original numbers, um, so you can just plug the analog lines into this, and someone would call from their house. Uh, they'd call the same number they've always called, and it, that's how it gets tied back into the uh, voice over IP system. So this is called a gateway, and like any other, like the term gateway we use in networking, it's just, it just 
it just translates from one technology to another. So in this case, it translates from analog to IP. Um, they also have a, I think Bill might have a couple somewhere, um, a Linksys uh, uh, power, uh, POE, a power over Ethernet switch. Um, the phones that, that I had were called SPA 942s. They were uh, four-line phones, full-featured phones. I think Bill's got a little bit different model, but they're similar. Um, yeah, I think those are two line maybe, but anyway, the, but these are four line phones. They're nice phones. It would be something that you see in any in any office. And then this is just a uh, wireless router that you may have. And these analog phones could also be um, the analog phones could also be you could also plug in faxes or anything else the company might have. Um, so when you get done, it's sort of it it will replace what they have, but they'll, they'll get more features, but still at least be able to keep what they had before. And this is just sort of an example of. I mean, obviously, this is a much uh, bigger um, system. This sort of shows you uh, what a, a large enterprise scale system may look like. Um, and certainly most today, uh, the majority of large enterprise uh, uh, systems have gone to some version of voice. What I'm going to show you doesn't replace this, right? This is, uh, you know, a, a huge, huge implementation. Um, well, I mean, why? I mean, why do we really create any class? I think, at least in the workforce side, we create classes because there are students who need the skills to get a job or a better job, right? So, uh, like I talked about before, um, uh, voice now is just another part of a network technician's job. So, um, certainly uh, on a help desk uh, today, if you've got a voice, uh, a VoIP network, uh, people would call and say, "Hey." Um, um, you know, can you add this feature or change the name or I forgot my password on my phone? Well, it would be the same help desk that the network people are probably on. PC technicians today would install the phones. They'd troubleshoot the phones. Um, and, and the server administrators, if you've got a large infrastructure, uh, you might be using either Microsoft's version or Cisco's version, but they're all server-based with GUI. So the same technicians that we're teaching in Cisco or the other courses that we're teaching, server, exchange, they would also um, uh, uh, probably be good for them to know voice as well. Okay, so let's go over um, what what was created, and, and I've got uh, what I'm going to do is show you. Uh, we're going to I've got three of the labs printed out. That's as far as I wanted to print out because they're pretty thick, and and you know traveling from Florida, I didn't want to have 400 pounds of of manuals. But uh, anyway, all this stuff's going to be available. Ann's not here right now, but all these labs will be available uh, online. For you all to download the grant paid form. I think the only holdup now is they're just going to have a system so they can sort of track who downloads them so they can get feedback and, and stuff like that. So I don't know, uh, Ann may be able to tell us when she comes back, if she comes back for this session, when it will be up there. So there's 12 modules, and I'll go over what it, what's in each module in a minute. Uh, so each module has the PowerPoints, it sort of goes step by step. Uh, there's a hands on lab for each module, a hands on test for each module and a written quiz for each module, and there's also a final hands-on and, uh, hands and a final written. And each module takes about an hour, hour and a half, give or take each. So if you want to include something like this in your existing courses, you can, you know, take part of it. Um, or it could almost be an entire class in itself if you want to do that as well. Or you could make it a capstone or just a special project maybe for some students who are interested. So the, the, the modules that we created are you sort of have to start out with, you know, you have to configure the basic switch and the router. And the router is just a uh, Linksys wireless router. You probably have those laying around somewhere. Um, also, there's a configuration wizard that, um, that you need to set up the uh, devices with. So we go step through setting up the, uh, the PBX, um, the gateway, uh, setting up a syslog server, you know, to keep track of errors or issues that come up. Uh, how do you add additional phones? Because uh, one of the first labs is have you set up two. Um, all the options, Bill showed you some of them, but there's tons of options that are available uh, in both, you know, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the version that Bill showed you. And really what, what this is is this asterisk as well. Um, uh, this, this has voicemail and hunt groups. Uh, hunt groups are basically a way if one if, uh, if you dial a number, it can ring, um, say, sequentially around a room if you're a, a small help desk, or it can ring all the phones at one time. You can configure that yourself. Uh, there's tons of calling features. There's also an IP soft phone that I found that was free online. 
Um, auto attendant is a way if you call if you call up a number and instead of getting a, a person that answers, you get the menu. You know, dial one for this, two for that. You can set that, that up as well. And this and this baby, I'm really proud of, is getting it to work on Skype. Um, it was like I think it, I think I had to pay like ten bucks. I only did it for a couple of months, but I bought a subscription with Skype so I could do inbound and outbound calls. So and, and students really love that they could actually call from their you know their phone in their lab. They could call their cell phone um, and you know make a call that way. So they 